Well, accent or no accent, I can never get used to people applauding before you've actually said anything. <laughs> but I, I appreciate the sentiment and uh, the, the distinctively Californian accent of applause. And uh, I'm very grateful to your president, Dr. Kim, for uh, his very, very warm welcome to me. And I did genuflect when I saw that Dr. Godfrey was here. So I think I've now fulfilled all righteousness <laughs> and uh, can get on with the business for which I was actually invited. Although I can't resist saying that scholars have discussed for some time whether I think the subtitle of perhaps the second edition of Calvin's Institutes was Calvin's idea or the publisher's idea. And I should say that the subtitle of that book, Some Pastors and Teachers, was not the author's idea, but the publisher's idea. So with that word of self-justification, I do want to say to you, because those of you who are students may never have had the privilege of meeting uh, Dr. and Mrs. Dendalk, and I am uh, very thrilled and touched that Mrs. Dendalk is able to be here. Uh, I wish you had been able to meet uh, Dr. Dendalk. Uh, they hosted me on more than one occasion in their homes, and since it took me a pretty extended pilgrim's progress to get from the Highlands of Scotland to this spot in uh, California, and I've been thinking about the pilgrim's progress, it's reminded me that a visit to their house was very much like a visit to interpreter's house for me. Um, and uh, their friendship and love is uh, uh, a wonderful treasure that those of us who enjoyed it are still able to enjoy. So none of these comments count, I hope, President Kim, towards the time I've been allotted for the lecture, <laughs> and it will begin now. And I've chosen this subject partly because I thought that Bob Dendalk would have been, and who knows what they know in heaven may even be, pleased with the subject, a Christ-like ministry. And I want to make a number of comments at the beginning of this lecture to try and set this into uh, a particular kind of context. Um, those of us who preach eventually find ourselves, I think, regularly exhorting those to whom we preach that it is so important, not least in our own generation, that our people be Christ-like. Because at the end of the day, Christ-likeness is the goal of divine predestination. In Romans 8, 29, it is the fruit of the Spirit's ministry as he conforms us to the likeness of Jesus Christ. It is, it's part of the eschatological vision. Um, we, we do not now seem to be what we will be, but when he appears, we will be like him. And so, urging on people the importance of Christ-likeness and ministering to them the Word of God that shapes them in Christ-likeness uh, has been certainly for me, and I'm sure will be for many of you who are students and is already for those who are already preachers and pastors, very much at the heart of the burden we have for our congregation. But it struck me as I was reflecting on what I might do in these lectures that that theme seems to me to be almost entirely absent from the massive amount of instruction that there is available to us as preachers and future preachers today. My own sense of things is there has never, in perhaps in the history of the Christian church, never been a time when so many preachers are writing on preaching as is true today. And not only seminary professors who are the scourge of students' lives, but preachers. There are more seminars in preaching, there are more courses in preaching, there are more institutes that focus on preaching than I suspect 
there has ever been, certainly since the informal way in which this was done in the 17th century in England. And yet, in the midst of all this, it strikes me that perhaps both in seminary and also outside seminary, in many of these uh, formation institutions, what is almost always emphasized is hermeneutical, the right handling of the text. And of course, certainly in my lifetime, there has been almost a tsunami in various contexts of emphasizing the importance of preaching Jesus Christ from the Old Testament, okay? And yet so little emphasis, it seems to me, certainly in the fairly small pool in which I swim, so little emphasis that preaching Christ should be accompanied in the preacher by a Christ-likeness. And yes, the seminary can teach us the hermeneutic, and the presbytery is going to look after at least some of the qualifications for ministry. But only Christ and the gospel can teach us Christ-likeness. And it strikes me in this context, and again I speak only out of my own context, that we're living in a time when uh, there is so much social media impact on younger men, models that you can choose in a way that certainly would not have been true in my earlier days. That when we think about many of these models and we're asked for a sentence to describe what is it about their ministry that really leaves its impress on us, I'm not sure that the majority answer would be it's Christ-likeness. It's Jesus Christ himself. And yet it has increasingly seemed to me to be part of what Paul must have been driving at when he said to Timothy or wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 15, one of the things you need to do in your congregation, Timothy, is to make sure everyone sees you're making progress. I have to say, and I know congregations uh, can be very vociferous about all kinds of things, they're not always particularly vociferous in praise for their ministers, but I've very rarely heard a congregate say to me about his or her minister, I've really noticed in the last few years how much progress they've made. Now, there may be reasons for that. This is a very searching comment, isn't it? Make sure as you minister the gospel of Jesus Christ that everyone in your congregation sees that you are making progress. So the theme of these lectures is a Christ-like ministry. I'm not sure that I will say anything uh, that is particularly new, certainly uh, nothing that may strike you as being particularly profound but I hope it will stir up in you by way of reminder by my throwing three pebbles into the pool of your life to stir up by way of reminder why it's so important for us that in all that we do to seek to equip ourselves to be ministers of the gospel, at the heart of absolutely everything is our desire to grow in the knowledge of Christ and in likeness to Jesus Christ. And since everything that is, is ultimately about this, um, I've chosen as a a kind of um, limiting concept, three notions, three elements that Paul speaks about in his letter to the Philippians. The importance of our affections, the importance of the kind of mindset that we have, and the importance of our personal knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us at seminary nowadays are familiar with the concept of the mirror reading of the letters of the New Testament. Um, What we get is one end of a telephone conversation and uh, 
to a certain extent, we have to guess what was happening at the other end. And I want to try and adopt a kind of mirror reading of elements in Paul's letter to the Philippians, not in the sense that we are trying to work out what was happening to the Philippians, but in order to put the mirror up in front of the Apostle Paul and think about what Paul is doing by way of ministry as Timothy, who is included, of course, there in the introduction, for all we know may have been the amanuensis, as Timothy, if I can put it this way, is not so much looking out to the Philippians, but looking up at Paul and listening to Paul and learning from Paul as Paul himself recognized he would, learning from the disposition, the emphasis of the Apostle Paul, what the Apostle Paul himself was doing in ministry, what his burden in ministry was when he was writing this letter to his crown and joy church in the city of Philippi. And it's three of these emphases that I'm sure you're very familiar with Philippians that occur first of all in chapter one in the introduction and then in chapter two in the great Christological section and then in chapter three, which is his very personal comments on his own knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning I want to focus attention on what he says in the introduction in verses 1 through 11, and especially in this concept where he says that God is my witness, verse 8, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. How I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, most of us love Philippians for many reasons. One of the most obvious um, in uh, the first few words is it was obviously a Presbyterian church or a Reformed church. It had elders or bishops and deacons. And of course, it's characteristic of Paul's introductory prayers that the burdens he expresses to the Lord and shares with his recipients are burdens that he deals with in the course of the letter. So already in the introduction, he focuses his concern on their unity. He uses language that embraces them all in the church and their unity is something of a concern to him because of the uh, opposition that's coming from outside because of the little seed of disagreement that there is already in the inside. He underscores his joy. Uh, the old commentator uh, Bengal uh, sums up Philippians rightly or wrongly by saying its message is gaudio gaudete. I rejoice and therefore you should rejoice and certainly that's an undercurrent in the letter. He rejoices in his partnership, his fellowship with them. And he is encouraged by this unshakable confidence that the work which God in his goodness began, the arm of his strength, will complete. And he knows it's right that he should think this way. Right, because looking back, he remembers the extraordinary work of God that even brought him to Philippi. And he remembers the extraordinary work that God did in Philippi. And in chapter 2, he is reassured that the Spirit continues that work that was begun when he was in Philippi. So this is a church, by contrast, for example, to the Corinthians, where, remember in 2 Corinthians 6, he opens his heart to them and begs them to open their hearts to him because their hearts have become closed. This is... Uh, this is a context like Westminster, Escondido, in which it's relatively easy for Paul to open his heart to them. And the point I want to focus down on is that everything he pours out about his relationship to the Philippians and about them, his whole ministry to them is a ministry that arises from his affection for them. It's right for him, he says. It's, it's consistent with the gospel for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart and I yearn for you with affection. 
And so this is the fundamental dynamic of this section. And in a sense, it's the fundamental rationale for Paul's whole letter to the Philippians. And perhaps I can put the significance of this for ministry in these terms. I've met men who, when asked why they want to go into the ministry of the gospel, who will give the answer because I absolutely love studying the Bible. Uh, (laughs) Oh, but wait a minute, because I love to preach and to teach people. Uh, uh. And what has never been probed in them is this question. Do you love the people to whom you're going to preach? Because that's an entirely different thing. And it will make a difference to your preaching. It will make a huge difference to your preaching. Whether what you do is essentially a spoken essay in interpreting a text not 200 miles distant from a really fine lecturer in an English department exegeting a text of some great work of English literature. But to do that in a way in which it is expressed in what you do, that you do this out of love because you yearn for these people with the affection of Christ that creates an atmosphere in both individual pastoral ministry and especially in those moments of preaching. And I say that because of this great paradox, to me akin to the paradox, why does God sometimes send unusual ministries of the Spirit into situations where there's nobody to teach the new converts? And this strikes me as being a parallel here Why is it that when I am preaching, when you are preaching, and we want to be diminished, I must decrease, he must increase, that what actually happens existentially is you increase? Apart from those moments when your mind loses the plot, your mind is working far more rapidly than it does in almost any other situation except maybe when you're sitting an exam. Your affections are expanded in ways they are not normally expanded in ordinary conversation. If I spoke to you like this in ordinary conversation, you would say, Ferguson, get out my face. (laughs) You're just too much. But the paradox is this, that while we may piously pray, hide me behind the cross, we actually become larger in the sight of the people. And the concern there is that God in his mercy may have mercy upon our people, but he doesn't always hide what we actually are. And we communicate that. And so this seems to me to be the importance particularly of what I want to emphasize in speaking about ministry, the teaching and preaching of Jesus Christ in a Christ-like way that is expressive of the affection of Christ. And I want to try and probe this in the way of a kind of catechism uh, with five questions. And the first question is this, what is meant by affections? In some ways, the ESV is not altogether helpful here because it uses the, uh, the verb feel to translate phroneo, Um, And I think that can be misleading because it seems to suggest that Paul's speaking about feelings and then he's speaking about affections. But he's really speaking about mindset, first of all. And then he goes on to speak about the fact he has them in his heart. And then thirdly, he speaks about the fact that he yearns for them with the affection of Christ Jesus. So he thinks about them this way. He has them in his heart in this way. And this is right for him because he yearns for them with the affection of Jesus Christ. I don't think that this is a kind of um, order of, of salvation experience with Paul. That first of all he thinks and then five minutes later 
Uh, that thinking works down into his heart, and then another five minutes later, out of his heart comes the affection of Jesus Christ. Um, this is a unitary experience with no chronological distinctives. It's more like a flower opening and a variety of petals of beauty appearing that he simultaneously thinks in a certain way about them. He holds them in his heart in a way that corresponds with the way he thinks about them. And simultaneously there is generated because of these realities, this affection that he feels for them. Uh, one of the late professors of Old Testament at uh, Westminster in Philadelphia used to comment on the fact that the Hebrew mind placed the uh, physiological location of the affections at a lower point in the anatomy than we do in the West. He has the, the bowels of Christ towards them. And yet, when we ask the question, well, what do we mean when we speak about the affections? I think we're a little like uh, Augustine, you remember, when he says, well, you asked me about time, and I, I knew exactly what time was just before you asked the question. We all know what the affections are in the sense that, that we recognize them in ourselves, but what are we talking about here? Well, what we are talking about here is our inner self-giving of our person to another person, or it may be a thing, but in this case, to another person, in a way that our giving of ourselves to them is shaped by the situation, the context, the identity, and the various needs of that individual. There is a kind of symbiosis that takes place psychologically between ourselves and them. 17th century Puritans, of course, had a special interest in this. William Fenner, in his uh, 1650 work, A Treatise of the Affections, that, of course, is the short form of the whole title, has this to say. The, the affections are the forcible and sensible motions of the heart or the will to a thing or from a thing, towards a thing or away from a thing, according as it is apprehended to be good or to be evil. And then a greater than William Fenner, uh, John Owen puts it this way. He says, the, the affections are the only power of our souls whereby we may give away ourselves from ourselves and become another's. Now, isn't that what Paul's speaking about in 2 Corinthians 4 5 when he describes his own ministry? We are your bond slaves for Jesus' sake. And that's what Owen is pointing us to. The only power of our soul is whereby we give away ourselves from ourselves and become another's. It is the yielding of the inner man in such a way that it affects our whole psyche so that we embrace, make it our own, or reject, react against the object at which our affections are directed. And so from one point of view, it seems to me to be essential to the makeup of those of us who are ministers of the gospel that we actually are affectionate people. There are some people who seem psychologically wired in such a way that they are almost without affection. I, I knew a man not well. Uh, he interviewed me once. It wasn't an interview, but he was the kind of man who interviewed people. <laughs> and he told me that he had never had a blue day in all his life. And I was in my early 20s, and I had at least enough wisdom to keep my mouth shut. But what was going on in my mind was this. In that case, you almost certainly have never been elated. Mercifully, he had the wisdom not to go into the Christian ministry. And when you think about the Apostle Paul, isn't this one of the things that's so obvious about him? 
the highs and the lows, and some of them appearing in the New Testament cheek by jowl. So, in a seminary, we are especially concerned with the intellectual understanding of the Christian faith. But in pastoral ministry, it is amazing how singularly unimpressed congregations can be by our wonderful education. <laughs> amazing that some of our elders who know absolutely nothing about the things we know almost everything about think they know more than we do. Surprise, surprise. But this, I think, is something that touches people deeply. That the word of Christ is communicated to them through the servant of Christ in a way that expresses the affections of Christ. Now, that leads me to the second question. If the first one is, what are the affections? The second is, what in particular, what in particular are the affections of Jesus Christ? And what makes the answer to this question easier, at least by way of reference, is they're actually written all over the Gospels. So the answer is, go and read the Gospels, dummy. <laughs> and then, of course, you've all read it anyway. You need to read Warfield's famous essay on the emotional life of Christ, strangely absent from the 10-volume edition of his works. So if you've got the 10-volume edition of his works, you ain't going to find it there. And you need to, you'll probably find it online for nothing elsewhere. And Warfield, of course, does this masterly Warfieldian kind of exploration of elements of the emotional life of Christ, especially, of course, in uh, the context of the death and resurrection of Lazarus. But he wasn't the first to emphasize that. Nor was the man I'm about to quote, and I quote him not just because he was Scottish, which of course is a great reason for quoting him, <laughs> but because he wrote a once famous book that nobody reads any longer, and there are all kinds of reasons why they don't read it. It was called Imago Christi, The Image of Christ. And he has a chapter where he takes the story of the raising of the daughter of Jairus, or Jairus, or either or either, depending on where you come from. Now, what do I hear about the raising of the daughter of Jairus? What I tend to hear is, okay, this fits into, you've got to find out what the big picture is. So what has happened before? Well, before we've got the stilling of the storm. Forgive me if they teach you this at Westminster in Escodido, you've had the stilling of the storm, and then you've had the deliverance of the demon-possessed man, Legion, tremendous confrontation. And then you've got the healing of that poor woman who had been sick for exactly the same number of years. You noticed that, didn't you? The same number of years as this little girl had lived. And uh, Jesus heals her, and he raises the girl. What's the message? Jesus has authority over nature, over demons, over sickness, and over death. True, 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 true. But what you've just told me about is Jesus who fits into a category. So you've done the, the neat hermeneutical thing. You've shown me the structure of the passage. And this is a living illustration uh, it may not be a living illustration here. It's sure a living illustration where I come from. You go through certain processes. When you come to that passage, if you don't preach it this way, then you begin to lose marks. But what is it you've lost? Well, you've lost Jesus. That's what you've lost. You've told me about authority and power, but you've not told me anything about the person of Jesus. You give me theological categories, but at the end of the day, you've not actually preached Jesus, although it looks for all the world as though you preach Jesus. Now, listen to Stalker, and do not dismiss him because this is old style. This is what Stalker makes of the story of the raising of Jairus' daughter. <clears throat> 
He says, do you notice here Jesus' compassion? Do you notice here Jesus' profound sensitivity? Do you notice here Jesus' indignation? Do you notice here Jesus' delicacy? Do you notice here Jesus' modesty? Or we might put it in a word, do you notice that Jesus is here? At the end of the day, I think this is actually Chalcedonian orthodoxy. That we don't transform the Jesus of the Bible into a Jesus whose human nature does not exercise to the full and to perfection the blessed categories of a human nature. And at the end of the day, it's Jesus Christ people need. And this is, I think, what Paul means when he says that we preach him, we proclaim him. And it's this transition that we all need to learn, especially in transitioning from seminary to pulpit, the difference between having the categories and our developing appreciation of the identity and character of the person. And as I say, it's on the surface of the Gospels. I don't have time to go into all the details, but you, you can list them in your own mind. His amazement, Matthew 8.10. His compassion, Matthew 9.36. His joy, Luke 10.21. His anger, Mark 3.5. His distress, Mark 14.33 and 34. Where the language that's used almost conveys the sense of Jesus' mind edging towards derangement at the thought of Calvary. That's not a category. That's a reality. His sense of his spirit being troubled. His amazing sense of love for his people. That's how he connects in preaching. And so I think we could be bold enough to say, as probably has never been said before, that as Kepler spoke about the scientist being the person who was the priest of creation thinking God's thoughts after him, the preaching minister is the pastor of the flock who experiences Christ's affection for the flock, after him, in him and through him. And that leads us to a third question that I think bores down on this. And the third question is, how important then were Christ's affections in the ministry of the Apostle Paul? Well, first of all, we might say tongue-in-cheek, they were important enough for the Apostle Paul to swear about it. Uh, he says this before God. This is an oath before God in verse 8. Another reason why they're so important for Paul is because this, I think, undoubtedly, I can't stop to prove this, but I think undoubtedly this was one of the huge influences of regeneration on the life of Saul of Tarsus. Everything about him to that point communicates the notion of a man who is completely screwed in. He may have been screwed up, but he was screwed in, tightly wound single focus, determination, absolutely type A++++. <laughs> and what happens to him through his regeneration, through his knowledge of Christ is that he, he, he gradually is taken to pieces. And in ministry, you, 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 you frequently encounter people that you wouldn't say to them, but you might say to your wife, I wish I could sit him down and just take him to pieces and then, or her to pieces, and then reconstruct them. Because they are wound the wrong way. But then, by God's grace, he is unwound. And one of the most evident fruits of his regeneration is what I call the stretching of his emotions. I went through a period, I think, in my teens when the teaching that was being given to me was, when you become a Christian, what happens is you learn to live the balanced Christian life. <laughs> 
And it was presented in such a way that what happened to your emotions was, of course you didn't live on the basis of your emotions, but they got narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. They were stoicized. But in fact, in the gospel, balance is created by us being stretched at both ends of the spectrum, isn't it? The heights of joy, ecstasy, and the depths of distress, agony. And sometimes these appear cheek by jowl in Paul. I mean, the commentators have often puzzled about the connection between the end of Romans 8 and the beginning of Romans 9. He's absolutely in the heights at the end of Romans 8. The beginning of Romans 9 is in the depths. But you see, in the gospel, these two things belong together. They're part of the stretching. They're part of the humanizing. There are realities in the gospel that raise us in our affections to the heavens and the realities in the truth of the gospel, the reinterpretation of reality the gospel gives to us that brings us down into the depths and without the heights, we would be completely lost. And this is embedded in Paul's understanding of his ministry. I say I throw a pebble into the pool, but sometimes unless a pebble comes into your pool, you can read something, like an author reads something, other people read something, and then the book, you open the book, and the first thing you see is there's a misprint, and you think, how many people's eyes have seen this, and nobody has spotted this? And it can be the same with Scripture, that we don't see how the affections of the Apostle Paul are all over the way in which he expresses himself. And I can't go into all of the passages, but they're there in Philippians. They're there in 2 Timothy. They're there especially in 1 Thessalonians 2. They're there as he writes to the Corinthians. So much so, I think that we can say this should be a sine qua non for our ministry. And a more important element in our understanding of what it means to be called to minister to the people of God than it sometimes is. The affections of Jesus Christ. So what is meant by affections? What in particular are the affections of Christ? How important were Christ's affections in Paul's ministry? And then question four, in which I've already touched at least. Why? Are the affections of Christ so vital for our ministry? In later life, which is where I now live, I've found myself often coming back to Aristotle, uh, who obviously for all kinds of reasons went out of fashion with his emphasis on the fact that good communication characterized by three attributes, uh, logos, ethos, pathos. Or, as he put it, ethos, pathos, and logos. But then he wasn't a Christian. So we put it logos, ethos, and pathos. And what he was driving at is that that is actually part of good communication from human to human. And gospel communication is not communication from inhuman to inhuman. So we might say there is a common grace wisdom in this triad. That yes, the, the, the power of the logos of the gospel. I, I don't know about you, I find myself more and more concerned in examining scripture to preach on it, to try and work out what is the logic of the gospel here. And then that marrying of the truth of the gospel to the the, the style and atmosphere of the person's life who communicates it. That there, sh there, there, there is a level of consistency, a recognizable integrity. That what the qualifications for those who are apt to teach is partly about. There should be an integrity between the logic of the gospel and the life of the person who communicates that gospel. But then also that, that logical gospel with its theological logic to which the preacher's life bears testimony in its consistency be expressed in the 
what we might call the, the emotional register of the text itself and of Christ himself. As though this were the oil that enabled the, the logic of the gospel to run into people's hearts on smooth lines through the integrity of the preacher and through the affection of the preacher for those to whom he preached. And of course, that doesn't mean every personality is the same. That doesn't mean that the affections belong to type A personalities. Actually, type A personalities may be the ones who find this most difficult. I was struck years and years ago, the first time I ever read Dr. Lloyd-Jones' book on preaching and preachers, that he pointed this out as what he thought was the greatest weakness in his preaching. And if you ever, I heard Lloyd-Jones preach. I actually had to preach to him, to other people when he was sitting where Dr. Kim is. That was when I learned that you're preaching in the presence of God and not in the presence of great preachers. The, lo the logic on fire, but pathos, affections, the communication that this is more than a mighty utterance to a huge congregation, but this is the heart of Christ expressed no matter how many people are in the congregation through the heart of the preacher. Now, why is this so vital? That's my fourth catechetical question. Well, let me suggest four reasons. Number one, because the scriptures themselves are affection-filled. The scriptures themselves are affection-filled. I mean, presumably you took church history, some of you with Dr. Godfrey, and you learned there was a book in the Old Testament called the Psalms or the Psalms. And it's full of affections. I, I'm not doing this because he's here. I sometimes wonder if the demise of singing the Psalms has had the unintended consequence of removing affections from the lives of younger preachers in the 21st century. But after that rant, let me get back to the point. Listen to William Fenner. He's quoting the great humanist Rodolphus Agricola. Every man that hath any learning at all is able to teach. That's actually true. But to shake men's affections and touch men's hearts, he is an extraordinary man that can do this. After this manner, says Fenner, was the preaching of our Savior. And listen to this. The preacher that preaches not affectionately preaches but one half of the word. It's interesting, isn't it? It's knowledge puffs up. Theological knowledge puffs up. Ability in hermeneutics and exegesis puffs up, but love builds up. And it would be tragic if what happened was that we, yes, completely without intention, ended up puffing up people because they were thinking, I am learning so much. But there was no corresponding reality at the level of the affections because we taught them as one who had no affections. I know I've forgotten a couple who hosted me once or twice over an extended period of years, and I preached in their church after their previous minister had gone somewhere else. They were completely faithful people, loyal people, hugely committed people, wonderful people. And they said to me in a, a moment of um, confession, they said, as we look back over the last decade, we, our, our assessment is... We were very well instructed, but we were very poorly nourished. Very well instructed, but very poorly nourished. Head communicating to head without going through heart. 
communicating through head to heart. So it's important because the scriptures are full of affections. It's important also, and I've at least given a hint of this, because of the danger of disordered affections. Now, um, those of you who may have been reared among the Jesuits uh, will know that this is what Ignatius Loyola's spiritual exercises were all about. Spiritual exercises to overcome oneself and to order one's life without reaching a decision through disordered affection. And it is, it's been, you know, Joseph Ratzinger used that kind of language fairly frequently. Disordered affections actually are sinful affections. But the point I want to make is the danger of their disorder. Because I believe with all my heart that they are not always hidden when we preach. I mean, you must have had this experience, you must have had this experience if you, if you preach, that you've sat listening to somebody preach and inwardly you're crying out to the Lord, oh Lord, please, please tell me I don't sound anything like him. <laughs> and your fear is, that is, that's exactly the truth, help me God. But what is it that's happening? Well, I know it may be that the exegesis has been rubbish. I know that. But the exegesis actually can be good, and you still feel that. Because in the communication, the disorder of the man's affections has not been hidden. And how does this express itself? I think there are telltale marks. One is that, one is that there is no personal tone at all. There is the communication of a sense of personal distance between this text and anything about me because it's this text that's really important. And you see, that great emphasis, which is right, the text is important, can also be a great snare because it's so easy for us to defend ourselves in our areas of weakness by emphasizing the areas in which we have a strength. Second telltale sign of this is what, what I call a stance of antithesis between the preacher and the hearer. May the Lord have mercy on me. You may be experiencing this right now while I'm speaking. <laughs> that I'm against you. And there is a mode of preaching. I, I suspect it may even have been developed just because of the welter of people you can watch and listen to on social media. Why does everybody feel that their sermons need to be exposed to the whole world? <laughs> because there are some angry preachers around. And their anger is on the basis of righteous indignation. But their anger is utterly unchristlike because their indignation is being directed towards the Lord's sheep and his lambs. And they justify it on the basis that the Lord showed anger towards the Pharisees. And they're just angry people. And the mode is attack. And what it turns out to be actually is, is lack of confidence in the word of God to do its own work. And lack of an understanding that the first place it's got to do its own work in is in here. There's another telltale sign of this. It's a little more subtle. It is that the preacher understands the importance of indicatives and imperatives and their relationship to each other. I mean, you can listen to preachers and you want to think, please, not another chiasm, <laughs> not another indicative and imperative. But you know, um, don't quote me on this, please. I have heard preachers whose tremendous emphasis is on the indicative, but when they emphasize the indicative, their affections are imperatival. That is to say, paradoxically, their preaching has not been molded by the reality which they understand theologically, but are not communicating affectionately. And one of the, the most obvious signs of that is that where there is affection, it's always coming down on you. Brothers, it is the easiest thing in the world, I think, 
to plaster people's brains against the walls because of their sin. And for us sinners, it's the most difficult thing in the world to exalt Jesus Christ before them so that they see him in all his glory and want him. Remember what C.S. Lewis says about writing when he, he responds to people who say, I want to write. He says, we've got to have something to write. <laughs> then the other thing he says is this. He says, never tell people how they should feel about something. I hope I've not been transgressing the C.S. Lewis principle here. Never tell people what they should feel about something. Describe that something in such a way that they will feel that way about them. You think, you know, number of sermons we listen to where the indicative has not been sufficiently glorious and the result is the preacher says, this is what you should feel about this. But the law never works. Grace, that's the point. And so there are these telltale marks. And sometimes, alas, I'm becoming neurotic about this. Sometimes this is the result of very self-conscious cloning of ourselves on the great ones we see on YouTube or wherever. Don't do that. You may never be recovered from trying to be him. And it may take you years to become the self, the preacher that Christ really made you to be. And I say this is important because our affections are bound to affect, effect to our hearer's view of Christ. Um, I know this can sound almost mystical, but I think it is actually existentially a reality. I think, it's, to me, it's been one of the most frightening things in ministry that since most of the people who sit before me hear most of the voice of God through my voice, over a period of time, they are subliminally going to associate his voice and my voice, my personality and his personality. And you see that in congregations over a period, don't you? That's why reordering our affections after the likeness of Jesus Christ is so, so important. I sometimes wonder, has it ever crossed our minds that the place where we are called to be most like the Lord Jesus is when we're preaching? And that thought almost never crosses our minds, even when we're telling our people to be like Jesus. And of course, the great reform tradition has, in its best part, always emphasized that this is really an important part of preaching. Uh, whether you like Jonathan Edwards, that great British theologian, <laughs> sorry, I'm speaking to people who know their history of this landmass. There surely is something in him saying, him saying, this is Jonathan Edwards saying, that his goal in preaching is so to proclaim the truth of the gospel that the affections of his hearers are raised as high as possible. Here's my final rant. Why is it in contemporary homiletics there is so much emphasis on Luke chapter 24, Jesus showing in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, and so little emphasis on the fact that the effect of his preaching to them was that their hearts were burning? Don't you think there's a relationship between these two things? And don't you think it would be illegitimate of me to think I was doing the first if the second were not the result, at least among God's people? And I've gone over my time, but the last point is this. How do we follow Paul in having the affections of Christ? Well, Luther tells us, doesn't he, 
how to become a theologus, a theologian, a pastor, a preacher. This, he says, is the way taught by Holy King David, and doubtless also used by the patriarchs and prophets. David in the 119th Psalm. There you will find three rules, amply presented throughout the whole Psalms. They are oratio, meditatio, tentatio. Personal intercession. We do not reflect Christ without prayer. Extensive reflection. We do not find Christ in hermeneutics. We find him in the Gospels. And there are four of them. And tentatio. It emerges in our lives through testing and trials. That's not something anyone can give to you. It's handled entirely in the providence of God. It means that our hearts will be broken. As Lewis says, the only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. And how important is all this? I say this partly tongue-in-cheek, that the whole of Western Christianity has depended on the affections of a single individual. You'll recognize this. And so I came to Milan to Ambrose, the bishop, known throughout the world as among the best of men, your devout servant. At that time, his eloquence ministered in abundance the flower of your wheat to your people, the gladness of your oil, and the sober inebriation of your wine, like that. To him was I led by you, all unknown to me, that by him I might knowingly be led to you. That man of God received me like a father and showed me the kindness of a bishop on my coming. I began to love him, at first indeed not as a teacher of the truth which I utterly despaired of finding in your church, but as a person who was kind to me. Isn't that something? That the affection of kindness was what drew Augustinus to Jesus Christ and made us indebted to that great doctor of the church. Well, so much more I'd like to say. But may this pebble fall into the pools of our lives and as we feel the ripples, not to leave this lecture and say, I'm going to be a really affectionate preacher from now on, <laughs> but to pray that the Lord will grow us in this area one of many areas, but surely an essential one. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fellowship that we share together. We, we feel together that we are under this, not above it or at the side of it, uh, not one of us speaking it and others listening to it, but all of us together as we desire to serve you better in our own generation. So we pray that you would seal whatever is true and good and pure, and especially that which is applicable to ourselves as individuals. Seal it on our hearts and enable fruit, we pray, to be born from it. We ask it in Jesus' name.